Hey guys, thanks for joining me here on the Come Reason podcast. I just wanted to let you know that if you enjoy these shows, you can gain access to a lot of additional content by becoming a Come Reason Defender. With your tax-deductible gift of $25 a month, you'll be able to view exclusive videos, debates, and presentations, even by top scholars such as Dr. J.P. Moreland, Sean McDowell, J. Warner Wallace, Dr. Hugh Ross, and many, many more. Plus, our Defenders Library provides PowerPoint presentations and notes used to develop these podcasts. So check it out by logging on to the comereason.org slash defenders page on the website and see all the benefits your support provides. And thank you for supporting Come Reason Ministries. The last two decades have seen an assault against traditional values and traditional structures of society more than ever before. Trans activists are leveraging politicians to separate children from parents. Elementary schools are pushing soft porn books in their classrooms. And people are having fewer babies, while tech promises to outsource pregnancy. Hi all. In this week's podcast, I bring you a talk from the 2024 Dare to Defend conference. Now, Come Reason holds these conferences, bringing in top scholars and well-known experts to help Christians better understand the challenges of our secular culture and how to not only avoid their dangers, but to engage with them with wisdom and grace. Now, our next conference is slated for March of 2025, and you can find out more information by going to the Come Reason website. But today, I present a Christian understanding of why the family is under fire, the hidden threats that lie ahead, and what we need to do about it. It's From Family Values to Family Crisis, The Hidden War on Families, on this Come Let Us Reason Together. So we're going to ask Lenny Esposito to come on up. Most of you already know Lenny. He's a dear friend of Living Truth Christian Fellowship. Lenny is the, the president of Come Reason Ministries. Lenny has been in the field of apologetics since you were uh, how old, Lenny? <laughs> Well, we started in 96. So. Is that when you started the uh, website? Your, the website, yeah. yes. Yeah. Lenny's uh, debated top-notch atheist scholars. He has uh, written thousands of articles. He has uh, developed several presentations. Now, the war against the family, is this the first time you're going to First time. This? So we're the guinea pigs. This is my new thoughts. Your new thoughts. So. Lenny is a creative thinker, a great communicator, and uh, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for, for coming out on a dreary Saturday. But uh, hopefully you're having a good time. And you're not, uh, you know, there's not too much smoke coming from between the ears. So that's, that's always a good sign uh, for, my, uh, for my view. Anyway, um, the war against the family. Yeah. Sounds like a provocative title, isn't it? Well, uh, it may be, but uh, I'm not a big clickbait fan. And you may find that the enemy I'm talking about is maybe not who you think. But we're going to explore all of this. First of all, family itself. Goodness, what do, we, what do we know about family? We all have family. Some of us maybe wish we don't have as much family as we have. There's always one, right? But I, my point of view is that, you know, um, most comedians would be out of work if we didn't have family. <laughs> For example, it's kind of cold out. What's the definition of a sweater? A sweater is something put, you put on when your mother is cold, yeah. right? I actually call my children that. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> Ah, it's cold in here. Go, go put on a sweater. Um, I was raised in an Italian family. So that comes with a lot of pieces to it. Uh, my wife was actually taken aback because when we were first dating, I brought her over to a, a birthday party for one of my cousins. Now, I'm one of 16 grandchildren on my mother's side. And she was a little overwhelmed because 
I kept naming off cousins, right? That you're, kind of, you're like, do I have to know all this stuff? Right? But, uh, but it, it, it was great. Italian families are, are, are great. My mother was a little four foot 11 Italian mother, which, uh, which means that I wasn't hit necessarily a lot. I was more hit for distance. But that's, uh, that's another issue. Bonnie McFarlane once told how she was upset with her husband and she was going to show him just how upset she was by giving him the silent treatment. And after an entire week, he turned and declared, hey, we're getting along pretty good lately, aren't we? <laughs> so that, that's family. That's family. But recently, what we're finding is family is changing the definition, the idea. I mean, obviously, you're hearing this conference. You're hearing things like, critical theory and um, same-sex marriage and threats to what it means to be human. Matter of fact, when I go to these conferences, and I do attend a lot of them, people start asking, what do you think is the next threat for family? And if I ask folks in that, uh, some would say, well, it, it, it's definitely the transgenderism we're seeing. Or some would say, no, 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 polyamory multiple love interests within the same family. Um, yeah, it feels like there's an inevitable wave of change washing away traditional families and traditional values, but I think there's a bigger threat that nobody's tracking yet. Now, if you're at all familiar with the science of a tsunami, a tsunami is an interesting phenomenon because it's not a single wave, but it's a series of waves that happen over time. Tsunamis aren't tidal waves like they see in the movies where one big wave comes and crashes down. What happens is the sea rises over these series of waves, but these waves don't lose energy as they continue on towards shore, making the sea penetrate farther and farther inland with a significant force. They could travel unnoticed on the surface of the sea at up to 500 miles an hour, crossing an ocean in a day or less. But because they're under the sea, people don't notice them. It may be less than a foot in height, right? But because the top of the wave moves faster than the bottom, the sea rises and devastation can extend by thousands of feet or more. And we've seen this when earthquakes have happened in the ocean. Well, what I'm going to talk to you about now is what I think is the tsunami that's coming against the family that we note in things like divorce statistics or uh, maybe the Obergefell decision, but that not only has had some destructive capacities in the past, but when I'm looking out to the horizon, the things that I'm worried about most. So let's first of all define what we understand as family historical, historically. First of all, and biblically, the family is first introduced as a fundamental part of creation. We read it right in Genesis 126. God created us both male and female, and the two will become one flesh, Jesus tells us. Their progeny, therefore, and as Les just so deftly explained, have this idea of humanity bound in them. In fact, it's God's pinnacle of creation. It is very good that he created man in his image. And joining people together is something that God does, as Jesus explains in Matthew 19, 6, what God has put together, let man not separate. So that means that there's a binding of individuals in marriage. The binding of men and women together. This is what marriage does. A dowry, for example, was an ancient way to show that there was a significant value in the exchange of an individual uh, for marriage purposes. So marriage binds men and women together. That's one of its functions. It also, though, binds children to parents, and that's a very important function because children have only one source of origin, and that is through the sexual union of two individuals. In fact, for most of human history, 
One wasn't truly married until the marriage was consummated. The consummation of marriage was considered the completion of marriage. That the male and the female, the bride and the groom, must come together in a physical union in order to make the marriage whole. Matter of fact, in the Mid-Ages, uh, there were bedding ceremonies. And this actually happened all the way up until the 1700s, where the bedding ritual would have a wedding ceremony and the bridal party would literally carry the bride and groom into a bed. And after some symbolic interaction and prayers, they would draw the drapes and they would go out and wait until they said, the marriage has been consummated, it's, it's completeness. Now, the reason for the recognition of consummation is clear, because the children are literally the two joining together in one flesh. But in this marriage, then what you know is you know not only who the child's mother is, which is a relatively easy task, since mothers carry children and give birth. That's not that contentious in society. But you also know who the father is, who the individual is who's responsible for that child for the rest of his life developing life. And because the family becomes central in this way, because they are joined together in a way that makes them responsible for one another and then responsible for their progeny, the concept of the family becomes the building block of society. Societies aren't governmental in their primary makeup, they're familial. Matter of fact, all of the great societies started off in a family relationship, right? Rome, you hear Romulus and Remus is the mythology, but it is definitely a family that starts it. Uh, Larry Seidentop, in Inventing the Individual, writes this, the concept of family is a distinct institution that reaches across all, I'm sorry, that's not Larry Seidentop, this is the uh, Learning Center. It, they say they define family as a distinct social institution that reaches across all societies. It's therefore considered a cultural universal. All societies have families. Families are the most basic social unit upon which society is built. And Seidentop explains that ancient societies all grew out of family relationships. He says, when one looks closely at the beliefs and practices which shape Greek, Greece and Rome in their infancy, we find ourselves entering a mindset that generated a conception of society in which family was everything. It was not only in our terms a civil, but also a religious institution. And the impact marriage has on society becomes tantamount because, you see, children are a concern for the entire town. If you have a child who's born out of wedlock, well, who's going to feed that child? You know, we're an agrarian society, and if the rains don't come, there may not be enough food to go around. If we're invaded by a conquering tribe, they may burn up the crops. Who's, who's going to give up their dinner for that other child. This was a function of culture that was concerning. Children establishes a, town, a town's future as well, and parentless children must be cared for, and they draw from the productivity of the society as a whole. Widows also have this task uh, that belabors. As a matter of fact, the book of Ruth makes a really good point of this when uh, you know, Ruth, uh, Naomi is going back to Israel and she has her two widow daughter-in-laws with her and they're like you know what no one in israel is going to give you moabite ladies the time of day maybe you should go back to your families at least somebody there will care for you but if you come with me you know as a moabitess in israel you may not and and as a widow which means that you're kind of quote unquote damaged goods in ancient cultures uh you that may not work out well for you so you have to understand how important families were because they were your primary means of support if something happened or tragedy struck. So because they're not only fundamental to creation but fundamental to our human interaction and human existence, it's no surprise that the family has its roots in religious observance. The church, in fact, was the primary facilitator of what marriage was, again, for most of human history. We understood it even within Christendom as a covenant between two parties and God. In fact, most states didn't even bother 
with things like marriage certificates and things like that. They left those things to the church, even through the mid-1800s. Again, because it deals with fundamental aspects and natural aspects of life, the church was seen as the proper vehicle to sanction and administer marriage vows. You'd register your marriage with the church, just like you would register your baptism with the church. And it would maintain your understanding and allegiance to how you were treating one another, things of that nature, while the state would recognize the marriage as part of natural life, the way they would recognize the birth of a child as part of natural life. Even today in Middle Eastern and Eastern countries, such as Syria, Egypt, and even Israel, you can't, the only legally binding marriage is religious marriage. You can't go to the justice of the peace and get married. You have to have it sanctioned through uh, a religious institution. Violations of marriage, such as adultery, were also understood and administered by the church, uh, uh, adjudicated by the church, things of that nature. The Christian church was the primary organization that cared for abandoned orphans and children. And we can talk about how uh, in the early days when the Romans would abandon their infants on the Tiber, it would be the Christians who would come up and scoop them up. But that's changed. That's no longer true. Today, the state is the primary validator of marriage. It's the state to whom you have to ask for a marriage license. It's the state to whom you send off the certificates. And when the focus of marriage moved out of the church and into the government, many things start to follow from this. First of all, marriage becomes more contractual than covenantal. We see it more as like a business contract. Now, the state gets into this because, of course, legal questions arise. Um, you have health insurance and who's uh, appropriate to be able to administer uh, the finances that maybe a, a dying spouse has to deal with, or who's allowed to see him or make life and death decisions for him, whose house is it once the spouse dies, things of that nature, property rights, the needs to support the children, ownership after death, all become important to establish legal claims. But in requiring a marriage license for such legal recognition, the state usurps the role of the church that had been traditionally understood. I mean, there are other ways we can do this, right? We don't require you to get a license before you get pregnant, for example. The state recognizes that having children is a natural aspect of life, and therefore it gives you a birth certificate, but it doesn't give you a birth license. And there are those who argue that the state should similarly recognize that two people will join together in matrimony and certify, yes, the church has married them and we recognize this because they've let us know, as opposed to saying we need a license in order to grant the marriage. Now, common law marriages today exist in several state legislate, uh, legislative law, and it shows that this recognition can happen, uh, although the legal process may be tedious. But because the state has now taken on the role of primary validator, all the corollary issues that follow from that start to become the domain of the state. How and when to sever marriage, for example. You used to have to sue for divorce, show just cause. Now we have no-fault divorce. And in fact, common law marriages are starting to be dismissed and domestic partnership laws are taking its place, which is a much looser term and doesn't necessarily require all of the commitment of marriage. Not only that, but sex has become severed from the idea of marriage. Of course, since the advent of the pill, uh, the sexual revolution and things like that, uh, all of a sudden marriage is used as a separate domain from the child procreative process for which one of those bindings, as I mentioned, was primary. And then, the last thing that happens is we have this hyper-individualism in our culture that start to say, 
marriage is just something I do if it suits me, and when I do it, I may not be suited for it in 10 years, and that's okay. I'll just get a divorce and do something else. All of these are impacting the concept of family. Now, what's the result? Well, the first one's easy, non-permanence. You make things like no-fault divorce accessible, and everybody says, okay, cool, then we'll just do that. Um, as with all contracts, a contractual marriage can be renewed, renegotiated, voided, right? Let's just look at the terms of this agreement and see if it still suits me. Marriage gets reduced to that. In fact, we even have prenuptial agreements in order to, right? And these are very popular with celebrities. Brad Wilcox writes, husbands and wives with prenups actually express lower levels of commitment, happiness, and confidence in the future of their marriage. And women with prenups are especially likely to be less happy compared to their peers without prenups. That shouldn't be too much of a surprise. If that's what you're approaching marriage as, as something that's merely contractual uh, and interchangeable, then it's not a problem. Uh, children are marginalized by this. Again, this should be no surprise. When sex and marriage are divorced, uh, they become accessories. Do you want to have kids? Should we have kids? I'd like to have kids. It shows my success level in life. Uh, you know, as long as we're sending them to the right schools and doing the right things, people will, will think well of me. But when that happens, we lose something. Because the primary way we transfer our culture to the next generation is through our children. We teach our kids our values. We teach our kids right and wrong. We teach our kids the things to emphasize. Some of those things are, um, you know, social and not necessarily significant. For example, and I've used this example before, if you talk to um, Hispanic people, you know, it's not Christmas without what? Tamales. Christmas and tamales are synonymous. Now, as an uh, Italian, that, that took me by surprise. It was like 25 before I even knew that. But uh, some of those are insignificant. Others, like, you know, never strike a woman or uh, open a door for a lady or what our laws are based on, are not as insignificant. But once culture is replaced, then our civilization which are the outer workings that convey our culture, uh, starts to crumble and starts to become different. So that's the problem with the shifting culture of family. Now I'm going to talk to you about the threats. I'm going to just briefly mention the threats today because you, you can hear these quite a bit, right? You understand abortion as a threat against the family simply because it eliminates a generation of individuals. Of course, homosexual unions, by redefining marriage as something that's contractual, again, it's not a covenant, you can't have two joining together in one flesh, there is no progeny that can ever happen out of a homosexual union, not naturally. You've defined marriage in a different way. I mentioned polyamory. This is starting to get rumblings and you're starting to see more of it in the press these days. But I'm going to leave that aside right now because I don't think it's a primary threat. I think it's an ancillary threat. What do I mean by that? I think there will be some faction of individuals who will opt for polyamory. But it's not going to take fire. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is women don't like to share. It's, 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 a, it's a hard sell. Secondly, polyamorous uh, societies, take Mormons and, and uh, you know, fundamentalist Mormons and others, quickly find out that you run out of women. <laughs> and you have a whole bunch of guys, right? Because people are born 50-50, 50% male, basically 52-49. But, um, but what happens is if you're marrying three or four wives, then you got three other guys who get none. And it becomes a huge issue. So it's, it's non-sustainable. I don't think it's a major threat. But there is the concern of state usurpation of parental decisions, as we're seeing in the state of California, where if a 12-year-old says to her teacher that she's transgender, she could be rushed in and removed from her parents' care 
by fiat of the state, even if she doesn't live in California. These are all threats that I think are coming, but I also think they're all threats that you've probably heard before and can find out about. What's on the horizon? What do I see way out there that's the big tsunami nobody's talking about? Let's talk about that. The first big brewing danger is called natal apathy and antinatalism. Now, natal just means baby, right? So there's an apathy towards having children. And we're seeing it played out most prevalently in the millennial generation because they're the generation right now who are supposed to be having children. So let me give you some stats. Um, I'm going to be talking about natal apathy. I'm going to be talking about outsourcing procreation and our future of a brave new world. That's our outline for this section. So let's go, first of all, to natal apathy. Fewer people are having children today across all cultures. Matter of fact, replacement levels, which means that for every two people that are born, or for every two people that die, two people need to be born. Okay, that's a replacement level, basically. Usually it's about a birth rate of about 2.1% of the society. 2.1 for every two, every married couple. And that's not happening. As you can see, first of all, people aren't getting married. You see the chart from 1970, 69% were married, 17% were never married in the 18 to 49 bracket. We look today, it's 50% married, 31% not married, 2021. More importantly, they're not having babies. Um, the majority of childless adults say that the reason they won't have kids is that they just don't want to. Here's the statistic, 18 to 49-year-olds. This comes from the Purdue Research Center. 63% who are um, parents don't expect to have I'm sorry, this, these slides are backwards. Let's do this this way. Okay, so the one on the, the, one on the right there is a majority of childless adults who say the reason they probably won't have kids is that they just don't want to. 56% over a majority, we just don't want to have kids. 43% said some other reason. And for those who've already had a child... They just don't want to have more children. Now, that's a little bit more spongy because if you have two or three or four, we have four. People ask us after our third child, do you think you're done? We said, yeah, I think, I think we're done. After our four, we said, yes, we're done. It was much more clear. But the problem with this is manifold. For example, oh, let's wait for that. I want to highlight two individuals and two articles that I saw. The first is Rachel Cohen, who was writing for Vox. And the article is entitled, How Millennials Learned to Dread Motherhood. Essay that just came out. And Cohen lists many problems. Here's the quote that she has. Today, the question of whether to have kids generates anxiety far more intensely than your garden variety ambivalence. For too many, it inspires dread. I know some women who have decided to forego home motherhood altogether, not out of an empowered certainty that they want to remain child-free, but because the alternative seems impossibly daunting. Others are still choosing motherhood, but with a profound apprehension that it will require them to sacrifice everything that brings them pleasure. And in the article, Cohen lists several problems, climate change, the impact more people will have on that, Boredom and unhappiness as a stay-at-home mom. Not being able to be, have your fulfilling life, your fulfilling career. The aversion to commitment, as, you see in the, as you've heard in the quote. And the idea that I just simply wouldn't be a good mother. It's one of her excuses. Matter of fact, she says, I understand, and I've seen the TikTok videos of those you know, trad wives, those traditional ladies who are like baking the cakes and, you know, doing the kids' crafts. She goes, I think they're a little bit of psyops, though. I think that they're phony and they're, you know, and she has a point there. Most of the stuff you see on TikTok is probably phony. 
but uh, it's easy to dismiss. She's not the only one, though. In The Guardian, Cyan um, Cain made this point in her article entitled, Why a Generation is Choosing to be Child-Free. She writes, quote, When I think that it won't... As a matter of fact, she starts the article. When I think that it won't hurt too much, I imagine the children I will not have. Would they be more like me or my partner? Would they have inherited my thatch of hair? Our terrible eyesight? Then I remember the numbers. We're in the middle of a mass extinction. The first caused by a single species. There are 7.8 billion of us on a planet that scientists estimate can support 1.5 billion humans living as an average U.S. citizen does today. In this article, she references several of the different movements that are coming out for folks of her generation, like the Voluntary Human Extinction Movement, who hopes to gain a whole bunch of adherents and then have none at all. What happens when a generation doesn't have kids? Well, a lot of things follow from that. And what I think that both of these ladies, Ms. Cohen and Ms. Kane, don't understand is how much they're endangering their own well-being. Here are the objections. It's the economy. You can't afford to have kids in a day and age like this. Do you know how much things cost? Well, yeah, but did you know that actually more people make the standard of living go up rather than down? Real income is up. A matter of fact, population increase versus poverty thresholds show that the standard of living across the world, especially since the 1990s, has increased exponentially. For most of human society, uh, I don't think I have that slide with me. For most of human society, what we've seen is that people making today's equivalent for $1.20 was about 60 to 80% across the globe. Now it's uh, about 15% and falling fast. People are becoming more successful across the world. I also think that this objection has been around a long time, but it doesn't hold water. I mean, people in the Depression had lots of kids. It, you know, we're not as bad off as they are. If you ask a parent, they'll tell you, you'll find a way. The people in the Depression, they shared rooms. Everybody didn't have to have all that space. You didn't get your Starbucks every day. You didn't have all the streaming media subscriptions then. You just find a way. The kid who stood on the corner selling the newspapers would come home and not say, hey, I earned that money. That's mine. I'm going to use it to buy an Xbox. He would put it on the table for the family and say, this is for all of us. Overpopulation. Climate change. A world filled with evil. What about all of that? Well, in Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, this book was written in 1968. And in it, Paul Ehrlich said this, the battle to feed all humanity, it's basically over now. We lost. He writes, in the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can present, prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. I lived through the 70s. I don't remember seeing that. See the problem. Oh, here's my slide. Here's your prop, poverty, th uh, poverty thresholds. You can see 80% in 1820. It gradually goes down a little bit in 1900, 1950s. In about 1970, it starts to fall off of a cliff. And today, you're looking at maybe 15 to 10% who only work. That's an amazing advancement. If you want to find out more about these kinds of uh, concepts, you look at uh, Johann Norberg's book, Progress. It's an excellent resource. But the other reason why I don't buy these ar ar um, arguments is because of a television show I remember from about 50 years ago. Now, this is a show called All in the Family, and uh, 
for those of you who weren't around in the early 70s, it was a very popular television show written by a left-of-center producer named Norman Lear, who gave the son-in-law, Mike Stivic, all of the left-of-center points to project. And then, of course, the conservative guy was the ignorant bigot, Archie Bunker. But I want you to watch a couple of clips. And here's the first one. You sure had me fooled. I can remember a week about four years ago when all you could do was cry. What are you talking about? When I had the miscarriage. You know what? You're a hypocrite. It's taken me four years to find out you hate children. I don't hate children, Gloria. I love children. That's why I don't want to bring it into the world the way it is now. Oh, come on. Stop playing Hamlet. And you stop being so damn naive, Gloria. Take a look around you if you can see through the pollution. You want to take a kid to the beach nowadays? You don't give him a sand pail, you give him a garbage pail. <laughs> okay, Mr. Ecology, but all that can change. They're going to clean up the air, too. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? What about spray cans? What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right here. This is a killer. Oh, so now my hairspray is a killer. Yeah, your hairspray, my deodorant, all spray cans. I read that there are gases inside these cans, Gloria, that shoot up into the air and can destroy the ozone. What's the ozone? The ozone is a protective shield that surrounds the Earth that protects us against ultraviolet rays. You know what they can do? Yeah, they can give you a sunburn. Sure, when the ozone's there, but when it's all gone, you can get skin cancer, and God knows what it could do to the plants and crops. All right, Michael. Let's compromise. You let me have a baby, and I'll let you have my hairspray. <laughs> One word I've said. Gloria, some scientists are saying that in 10 years, at the rate the ozone's going, this world is going to be in big trouble. Well, Michael, you just can't go on being afraid of life. I'm not afraid of life, Gloria. I'm just facing it. <laughs> okay. In 10 years, this world's in big trouble. They didn't discount the idea that maybe we could do something about that ozone problem. Um, hold on. We're going to go back a couple. Um, again, don't these sound like familiar arguments? How would you answer this? Well, to Norman Lear's credit, he does something that many people today don't do. He'll always play both sides of the argument. So what happens in this uh, scene, this next scene, was Michael goes to the next door neighbor, uh, Gloria, um, who, uh, not Gloria, uh, what? Elaine? Edith, thank you. I was blanking on the name, who's Catholic. And he discusses it with her, and I want you to see this clip of what happens next. Something. I can't eat when I'm feeling this way. <laughs> How could she do that? She knows accidents can happen. Now, wait a minute, Buster. You were at the scene of that accident. <laughs> You're no innocent bystander. Oh. And you know something else? I think all your gobbledygook about not having babies because the world is falling apart is just a big crock. Sure, sure, Irene. You're saying that because you were a devout Catholic. No, I'm saying that because you're a devout coward. I think you're afraid of the responsibility of raising a child. That's a low blow, Irene. All right, if you don't want kids, then why didn't you have a vasectomy, huh? That's an even lower blow, Irene. <laughs> you don't want my advice. You just want me to tell you that the baby is glorious, fault, and that it's wrong to be bring a child into an overcrowded world. Yes, yes, now you're making sense. Look, before you blame this one poor little baby for destroying the world, I got something I want you to read. What is it, Vatican propaganda? What? I don't need any more poop from the Pope. <laughs> this happens to be from the Christian Science Monitor. Since when do you get the Christian Science Monitor? Since my Baptist butcher ran out of wax paper. Go ahead, Irene, make jokes. I came here for understanding. I thought I'd get somebody like Joyce Brothers. I got Joan Rivers. Thank you very much. Look, at least read the article. Yeah, I'll read it. <laughs> Look, honey, I, I was wrong. I, I really do want to have the baby. Hey, look, I, I want you to read something that's 
Says it a lot better than I can. It's uh, something Alistair Cook wrote. Alistair what? <laughs> Alistair <the> Cook? <laughs> of times our days are numbered anyway and so it would be a crime against nature for any generation to take the world crisis so solemnly that it put off enjoying those things for which we were designed in the first place the opportunity to do good work to fall in love to enjoy friends to hit a ball and to bounce a baby And it would be a crime against nature for any generation to take the world crisis so solemnly that it put off enjoying those things for which we were presumably designed in the first place. The opportunity to do good work, to fall in love, to enjoy friends, to sit under trees, to read, to hit a ball, and bounce a baby. We don't talk like that any longer. We need to. We have an entire generation of kids who don't understand that what they do impacts them. What are the risks? As I said, for the first time in U.S. history, older adults are projected to outnumber children by 2034. That's staggering. And the implications that follow are scary. First of all, personal impoverishment. Okay, you choose not to have children. You choose to be a childless couple. You get to jet set to the vacation places that you want to go. Your weekends are free. Great. But what that means is less economic freedom in the future. For when you retire and start drawing on Social Security, who's paying into that? As our working generation diminishes? Who's producing all the food when there's fewer workers in order to harvest? And across all domains, as fewer and fewer people start to create the goods that more and more retirees demand, salaries go up, which means prices go up, which means all of you on a fixed salary are really stuck. You may not be able to afford travel after 60. That would be problematic. It also means less emotional support for the future. Because when you're young and you think you're good and healthy and everything's running around, you don't understand that maybe as you age, your mobility decreases. Your eyesight goes and you need help having someone drive you around or your hearing starts to diminish and if you have no family children grandchildren to come and help you then do you just sit at home alone the pandemic gave us a foretaste of this people dying alone in their apartments not discovered for weeks because the neighbors didn't know. Is that what you're hoping your future will be? It's easy to put a rose tinge on things next year or 10 years from now. What about 30? Less scientific and medical progress happens. One of the reasons people understand the huge boom we've had in science, the discovery of new vaccines, is simply there's more scientists working on it. The more people you have working on the problem, and especially in um, science and medicine where it's a collaborative effort, where you write a paper and other people comment on it and some adopt ideas, and your ideas are refined and, and reshaped, and uh, you can uh, corroborate with different groups. As that diminishes, then our advancements diminish as well. Today, as population has expanded, the world's gotten better, disease is down, treatments become cheaper. Dean Spears, 
In the article, all of the predictions agree on one thing, humanity will soon peak. That's a New York Times article. It says this, quote, In this short period, humanity has been large and growing. Economists who study growth and progress don't think this is a coincidence. Innovations and discoveries are made by people. And in a world with fewer people in it, the loss of so much human potential may threaten humanity's continued path towards better lives. In fact, in none of the countries where lifelong fertility rates have fallen well below two, have those countries ever returned to it. And we are at 1.6. Japan's at 1.2. Personal impoverishment. But the powers that be will probably start to see this problem and try to come up with a solution. I'm sorry, there's the Dean Spears quote for you. What would the solution be? Well, like any government agency, they'll take the humanity out of it. We'll have human and social impoverishment. So, for example, IVF and mass production. Those are going to be two things that you're going to see more and more of. However, those are empty promises. This was a very famous article, uh, magazine cover, Bloomberg Business uh, from, I believe it's uh, 20, uh, 2017. It's her 41st birthday. This is Bridget Adams. And uh, it says she caused a sensation when she appeared on the cover of Bloomberg Business Week with the headline, Freeze Your Eggs, Free Your Career. Very much an idea that has taken hold today. However, they follow up with this. And in this article, it says, in early 2017, with her 45th birthday coming, no sign of Mr. Wright, she decided to start a family on her own. So she un excitedly unfroze the 11 eggs she had stored and selected a sperm donor. Now, two of the eggs failed to survive the thawing process. Three more failed to fertilize. That left six embryos, five of which appeared to be abnormal. The remaining one was implanted in her uterus, and on the morning of March 7th, she got the devastating news that it too had failed. Adams was not pregnant, and her chances of carrying her genetic child had just dropped to near zero. She remembers, quote, screaming like a wild animal, throwing books, papers, her laptops, and collapsing on the ground. Nobody told me this. Science isn't a panacea. In fact, even sperm donations can be problematic. There's a lot of moral and ethical issues that I have to skip because I don't have the time on IVF. And it's not always wrong. There are ways to do it appropriately. But the way it's commonly approached in our society is to just benefit the outcome at the sake of the children. And I'm going to leave that off to the side. If you have questions about it, I'll answer it in the Q&A. But let me talk about Eli here. Eli Baden Laser, hyphenated last name because he comes from a family of lesbian parents. And he understood that he was a sperm donor child, obviously. If you only have two moms, you had to come from someplace. And every summer, he went to a camp for same sex families. He said, last summer, news traveled through the community that two kids from two families who attended the camp for years had independently gone to a registry for family members trying to connect with donors or donor siblings. By the way, the drive for sperm donor children to find their biological father, studies have shown it's even, it's as strong, if not stronger, than the drive for adopted kids to try and find their natural parents. Because everybody wants to understand where they come from. So they have these registries. Two kids from this camp found out, hey, we're half siblings. They discovered that they shared a donor. They were half siblings. So, that made him curious, and he puts his name in. He found out that he had a friend at the camp that was his half-brother. And at 19, he found more, and then more. 32 siblings in all. And he said, I felt both curious and anxious about these people and what they exactly meant to me. 
the sheer quantity of them gave me a feeling of having been mass-produced. Another lady who wanted to have a child, Cynthia Daly, went to a sperm bank, registered several years later, looked up to see if her child had any siblings. Yeah, 150. Doesn't that diminish us? When we are not mass-producing at our rate, will others step in? Because it's just a resource. And here is a video I saw a couple years ago that shows where the future can go. Introducing Ectolife, the world's first artificial womb facility, powered entirely by renewable energy. Ectolife allows infertile couple to conceive a baby and become the true biological parents of their own offspring. It's a perfect solution for women who had their uterus surgically removed due to cancer or other complications. With Ectolife, premature births and C-sections will be a thing of the past. Ectolife is designed to help countries that are suffering from severe population decline, including Japan, Bulgaria, South Korea, and many others. The facility features 75 highly equipped labs. Each state-of-the-art lab can accommodate up to 400 growth pods or artificial wombs. Every pod is designed to replicate the exact conditions that exist inside the mother's uterus. A single building can incubate up to 30,000 lab-grown babies per year. Ectolife allows your baby to develop in an infection-free environment. The pods are made of materials that prevent germs from sticking to their surfaces. Every growth pod features sensors that can monitor your baby's vital signs, including heartbeat, temperature, blood pressure, breathing rate, and oxygen saturation. The artificial intelligence-based system also monitors the physical features of your baby and reports any potential genetic abnormalities. Pods are equipped with a screen that displays real-time data on the developmental progress of your baby. These data are sent directly to your phone so you can track your baby's health from the comfort of your zone. The app also provides you with a high-resolution live view of your baby's development. A special section in the app allows you to watch a time-lapse of your baby's growth and share it directly with your loved ones. Babies can recognize language and learn new words while still in the womb. Ectolife growth pods feature internal speakers that play a wide range of words and music to your baby. Through the app, you can choose the playlist that your baby listens to. You can also directly sing to your baby and make them familiar with your voice before birth. Our goal is to provide you with an intelligent offspring that truly reflects your smart choices. With Ectolife, miscarriage and low sperm count are a thing of the past. Prior to placing the fertilized embryo of your baby inside the growth pod, in vitro fertilization is used to create and select the most viable and genetically superior embryo, giving your baby a chance to develop without any biological hurdles. And if you want your baby to stand out and have a brighter future, our Elite Package offers you the opportunity to genetically engineer the embryo before implanting it into the artificial womb. Thanks to CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing tool, you can edit any trait of your baby through a wide range of over 300 genes. By genetically engineering a set of genes, the Elite Package allows you to customize your baby's eye color, hair color, skin tone, physical strength, height, and level of intelligence. It also allows you to fix any inherited genetic diseases that are part of your family history so that your baby and their offspring will live a healthy, comfortable life free of genetic diseases. Say 
goodbye to the pain of childbirth and birth-related muscle contractions. Ectolife provides you a safe, pain-free alternative that helps you deliver your baby without stress. The delivery process is smooth, convenient, and can be done with just a push of a button. Thanks to our miniaturized bioreactors and long-lasting batteries, you can use Ectolife growth pods at the comfort of your home, allowing you to incubate your baby in your building without the need to visit our factory. By owning your special growth pod, you will have the ability to build a happy family, one baby at a time. Tired of waiting for a response from an adoption agency? Unable to find a suitable surrogate mother? Worried about pregnancy complications? Worry no more, because Ectolife got you covered. Ectolife, reinventing evolution. Now that's, to be clear, a futurist concept, Hashem al Galilee. Uh, but we're not as far away as you may think. For in September, Journal Nature had this article. Human trials of artificial wombs could start soon. Here's what you need to know. Did you notice a couple of things in that video? Oh, we can help solve the underpopulation problem, the replacement problem for those countries. Do you notice the couple who gets to get frisky on the bed? Because she's not pregnant, the baby's in the facility. And we just monitor it on our iPhones. And if you want to avoid all that disgusting stuff like childbirth and pain, this is the way to go. It is literally Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. A lot of people talk about George Orwell in the society. George Orwell is a very governmental, top-down tyranny. Huxley has a negative utopia, a dystopian view of the world as well, but it's bottom-up. It's the people who demand that we continue these kinds of ideas. The word mother is considered a swear word, a curse word in his book, and people who have children naturally are the savages. How do we counter this tide? And I only have a few minutes left, but I hope to give you some forward-thinking ideas. And we as the church have a unique position to do so, because as Brad Wilcox has repeatedly shown in his book um, on marriage, as well as Nancy Piercy's book, The Toxic War on Masculinity, and many other studies, the Institute for Family Studies in Virginia, that's Brad Wilcox's place, uh, show this over and over again. Deeply religious people, individuals who attend services on a regular basis, have much better marriages on average than the general population, have much higher birth rates on average than the higher population. So we are especially called to do this. And the first piece of recommended advice I give is build proper relationships with your children. Because what Tim Carney says in his book um, is that the primary reason that people don't have kids isn't because of money, isn't because of th the environment. What it is, is we live in a culture that just doesn't understand that the natural course of human life is to get married and have kids. When we were growing up, that's what I understood being an adult is. You get married, you have kids, and you solve your own problems. So many in the younger generations today think that if there's a problem, it's antithetical to life, and then my parents have always solved my problems in the past. So, building proper relationships. First of all, you have to be clear on what your goal is as a parent. What's the goal of parenting? Your goal as a parent is to build virtuous and responsible adults, not to have your kids like you. Believe me, your kids will like you if you're doing, taking the steps to be building virtuous and responsible adults. But in order to build virtuous and responsible adults, you have to do things sometimes where they won't be happy. You have to do things for their own good. There's a scene in The Matrix, that old movie, where the computer simulator tells, uh, Mr., in the form of Mr. Smith, tells Morpheus, you know, our first 
virtual reality was a paradise for you humans, and you didn't seem to thrive on it at all. You seemed to thrive on suffering. And that's true. We make life too easy for our kids. And across most cultures, it's when they become too affluent that they begin to disintegrate. I think we have to disabuse them of these uh, three great untruths, Jonathan Haidt notes, that uh, Gen Z struggles with. The idea that you're fragile, that if they encountered something that was offensive to them, they would be made weaker by it. We have to dispel that idea. That if you feel it, it must be true. And Haidt says, students seem to have learned that they should always trust their feelings. This is what I call a Disney sociology, right? The, this belief flies in the face of wise counsel that teaches our feelings are unreliable sources of information. Learning to question our feelings, question that autonomic section, is important. And, uh, I'm sorry, um, life about, is about us versus them. We're ever couching that in our life versus us versus them. Good people and evil people. Uh, he points to Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago uh, with the famous line, the line that separates good and evil passes right through every human heart, which is, of course, a Christian understanding of humanity. So we need to be clear on the goal of parenting and focus on that. We need to reinforce our children's natural inclinations. Kids naturally look for the approval and acceptance of their parents. They won't hate you for punishing them. And sometimes the biggest impact you can have is when a kid finds out that you're disappointed. But you can also provide this acceptance deliberately, intentionally at specific times. Family dinner, for example, around the table. Make that a priority. Shut off the television and tell everybody that the, the cell phones have to be put away somewhere else. And have family dinner every night. You'd be amazed at how much bonding happens over family dinner. Game nights. I'm thrilled to see that board games are actually coming back in vogue. And I know many families who are using board games for game nights in order to just foster development with one another. These inclinations will grow the concept of family as opposed to the concept of the individual. And then reinforcing parental authority. Kids could, should conform to the needs of the adults and not vice versa. When you go out into the workplace, the boss doesn't change the company for you. Now, we laugh at that. But what happened in our state just a couple of years ago? Study come out. Oh, high school students aren't learning anymore. Well, what's the problem with their lower test scores? Well, a lot of them come in and say they're tired because they've been playing video games all night. Well, what should we do? The answer wasn't take video games away. The answer was, I got the idea. Let's move high school start times from 7.30 to 8.30. So what does that teach a young person? The world needs to move for me, not that I need to be responsible. Smaller families tend to make more of the mistakes here. And I understand that you want the kid to experience everything, the ballet, the sports, the piano lessons, all of that stuff. But sometimes saying, no, we can't do that. In fact, one shows respect to adults by submitting to them and their needs. Right? It's the adults who should be able to choose what goes on television. It's the adults who should be sitting in the front seat of the car because that tells children that they're not the center of the universe. And you need to model it consistently and early. So you need to build these proper relationships. You need to teach accountability. Let them take risks. For crying out loud, let them walk home from school by themselves. All those uh, stats you hear about children being abducted, 96% of them are custody cases. And the reason why you're hearing about them is because we have social media. It was actually worse in the 70s. If you think about it, kids are much safer today because every person is walking around with a video camera in their pocket. That didn't used to be true. But we tend to believe it because we see it on social media. Let kids fail. My son was a hockey player through school. And one of the first things they do when you're 
developing your hockey skill is they force you to fall. Why do they do that? Because they say, in a game, you're going to trip, you're going to fall. If you don't fall in practice, then you'll never know how to get back up on your skates and keep going. Over and over again, our society doesn't let our children fail. Or if they fail, we come back and clean up after them. We don't let them feel the repercussions of their failures. And that's a huge mistake. You don't go to the teacher and say, I can't believe you failed Johnny. You go to Johnny and say, why did you fail? Well, this teacher asked for so much more than the other guys. Well, that's life, Johnny. That's what this teacher, and you may have a boss that does that too. You better buckle down. Give them responsibility. Little chores, train them. Start early, even when they're two or three. If you're bringing home groceries, let them carry a loaf of bread or the toilet paper or something like that. Give them a ba uh, you know, bag of groceries and maybe you're holding one hand. But they understand that they are contributing to the family in that regard. Bring them into the conversation when you're sitting down to pay family bills. Hey, here's our money. Here's what we got to pay. Well, can't we just, you know, go to the movies? Well, you know, you like your internet, right? And that internet bill is about the same price as the movie tickets. So which would you prefer? Well, do what you like, but if we go to the movies, your internet's off for a month. When you bring them into the family bill discussion, even early, they start to see much more better, or much more completely, the responsibilities that adulting allows. Here's an idea. This I got from uh, William Lane Craig. He gave his children a monthly allowance. So what, when, by the time they were in high school, I mean, he worked into this, junior high, high school, he gave them a significant allowance once a month. But that allowance had to buy their school clothes, their toiletries, all of the things that they needed. Not communal food or things like that, but any snacks. And they learned to budget. Or they learned to go to school wearing last year's clothing, holes in their shoes. It's better for them to fail in that regard than to be evicted when they're newly married, don't you agree? And ask for accountability. When you get ready to give them that allowance, here's a question I don't think any parent has ever asked their child. What have you done to contribute to this family? Son, I love you. I'm glad to see you. Can you tell me what you've done this month to contribute to the family? Do you see how that removes the focus from the child and puts it on the family? How are you helping us as a family to move forward? Changes the conversation. It changes the perspective. And lastly, modeling love. Love and community. This, again, should be the church's primary role. The church should be your social center. It should be the way we understand one another in the larger context of the world. Charissa de Groot, founder of Raising Mothers, which is an African-American um, project, writes, quote, the biggest issue against seeing childbearing as, normally, as, normal, uh, as normal socially weird is basically, so she's saying people see childbearing as, nor as socially weird, but the biggest issue against that is uh, trying to avoid the weirdness. She says, previous generations did not experience the same vocal outward world that we're living in today, where everyone is telling you it's almost crazy for you to have children. The single biggest reason for resistance to having kids is simply it isn't part of the accepted social fabric of what it means to be an adult. As the church, we need to model that, that we care for one another above ourselves, that our excess income can go to support the older woman at the church who needs a tune-up but can't afford to pay the mechanic. So we need to show love and community and explain that. Our churches should be the primary vehicle in which we do that. We need to show our love in marriage, how we express our love to one another so that they get a strong model of what it means to be a caring family. We need to show our love in our personal devotions to God. You want your kids to be believers, they should see you praying every day. They should see you doing your devotions. It should be as natural as water for them. Expressing love to children means not shielding them from pain, but walking them through pain.
In conclusion, there are opportunities here as well as um, dangers. I leave you with the entire quote from Alistair Cook. He wrote, Politics will undoubtedly bedevil us all till the day we die. Even the prospect of early annihilation should not keep us from making the most of our days on this happy, unhappy planet. For in the best of times, our days are numbered anyway. And it would be a crime against nature, notice the capital N nature, for any generation to take the world crisis so solemnly that it was to put off enjoying those things for which we were presumably designed in the first place and which the gravest statesman and the horsest politician hoped to make available to all men in the end. I mean the opportunity to do, do good work, to fall in love, to enjoy friends, to sit under trees, to read, to hit a ball, and to bounce a baby. Thank you. Thank you for watching this Come Reason video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like these, consider subscribing to our Come Reason YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. Lastly, if you'd like to help keep these kinds of videos free, consider providing a donation by clicking on the donation button beside me. Thank you.